this event. The Feminist Library is a library and archive of materials relating to the women's liberation movement based in South London, which began in 1975. You can find out more about um, us on our website and information about donating to us as we're heavily reliant on donations through our friends scheme. It's an honour to be in conversation with Stella, who's best known for her co-authorship of The Heart of the Race, Black Women's Lives in Britain, which won the 1985 Martin Luther King Award for Literature and was recently republished by Verso as a feminist classic. She is a founding member of OWAD, the Organisation of Women of African and Asian Descent, um, which was a national umbrella group uh, that emerged in the, uh, in the late 1970s. Um, and is often described as one of the grandmothers of Black British um, feminism. Her career as a teacher, writer, artist and educator spans over 40 years. I think, just to introduce, I think this book makes a really timely and critical intervention into discussions about the slave trade and the, tragedy, uh, and the tragedies of empire um, in the UK. I think it comes at a time when there's renewed vigour for a critical uh, account of um, imperial nations and those nations' dependencies um, on the colonies to establish and sustain themselves through all manner of economic, racial and gendered exploitation. Um, utilizing the archive, I think Stella makes a, a case for strategies of resistance employed by enslaved women through means of sabotage, refusal, murder, and uprising. Um, and yeah, she demonstrates how ideas of labor and reproduction have been central to those women's histories. So we're, we're going to talk um, for about uh, 40, uh, 45 to 50 minutes and then open uh, the conversation out to questions. So please do put your questions in the Q&A um, chat box. But first, we're going to start with a reading from the introduction of the book from page um, eight. And Stella's just going to read um, as much as she wants, actually. Um, yeah, a couple of paragraphs. Okay. Um, page eight. All right. History has a convenient and highly selective memory. This much we do know. But if we sift through the evidence, a far more complex picture begins to emerge. The canvas may be worn, the paint may be cracked and faded but there are women in the foreground and they do not look happy. Look closer and you'll see them more clearly. Their bodies are bent, their feet calloused and swollen. They're menstruating, giving birth, collapsing from, from fatigue and dying from abuse or hideous diseases. Across their backs, thick keloid scars are clearly visible, as are the separating wounds left by brandings, collars and leg irons. But the few who are clothed sport dark sweat stains under their armpits. Some look half crazed with the horror of it all. Some seem resigned to the prospect of an untimely death. But others are watching, waiting, biding their time. Plotting their escape or dreaming of revenge. Occasionally, the glint of a weapon or a barely concealed vial of poison hints at a more ominous practice. Against this backdrop of unrelenting misery, some women have found ways to make their lives more tolerable. At first glance, they do not look like women who would willingly trade their bodies for trinkets or treats. Without doubt, there are some favoured concubines among them, women who have learnt to play the few cards they were dealt by opting to collude or comply. They stand haughty and erect, ever mindful of their perilous status. Yet those who seek favour rather than endure the miserable fate of their mothers and grandmothers are in a distinct minority. The numbers move for the, speak for themselves. They are the exception to the rule. Move closer and our picture becomes even more intriguing. Away from the fields, some women can be seen dusting the silver or waiting at table with lowered eyes and pricked ears. Others are busy, busy hauling produce to market or hiring out their skills as cooks, seamstresses, laundresses, nurses and midwives. Their mobility is a godsend, particularly for those with clandestine messages or overheard news to relay. A handful of female entrepreneurs have acquired or purchased their freedom and have opened lodging houses, supplementing their precarious income by administering to the sick or tending to the needs of passing travellers. With their keen, well-tuned ears, 
they too have a role to play in this vast subversive grapevine. A majority of the women are toiling in the fields and mill houses. Many have an angry glint in their eyes as they feed the huge rollers or squint skywards at the merciless sun. Beyond them, in the distant mountains and forests, hard to detect in the dense foliage, we may even catch the occasional tantalizing glimpse of a female maroon, proud, ferocious women, so intent on a self-determined life that they prefer the risk of a brutal death to the prospect of recapture. With this more nuanced image of female resistance in mind, it cannot be right that their historical legacy is so one-dimensional. As the planter monk Lewis observed, black women were kicked in the belly throughout the period of slavery. Yet in many ways, these women's response can be seen as a metaphorical kick in the belly for those who tried and failed to dehumanize them. To deny them their rightful place in history simply adds insult to a 400 year long injury. Thank you so much. Is that much. enough? <laughs> Thank you so much. It's horrible trying to read your own stuff, you know, it just doesn't, doesn't uh, feel easy, but. Um, I, yeah, but I think what really struck me when I was reading um, the book and what came out when you were reading just then is how um, you've managed to, using archival material, weave this narrative. And so I guess my first question um, was about like the archive and all of the material that you use to substan um, substantiate the observations that you make in order to like craft your arguments. So I guess if you could talk a little bit of, um, about how you engage with um, the kind of diary entries, the information um, from like slave owners, um, from those who were enslaved themselves, um, to kind of piece together your arguments about resistance. Um, what does the archive offer us and how um, can we engage with it to, um, to unearth these histories in the ways that, that you have? Okay, well, I think the best way to answer that question, Lola, is to just talk a little bit about my process. Um, I started writing the material when I um, had a year off in, back in 1985 to do a sabbatical year at SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies. And um, at the time, I was simply focusing on women in Jamaica and, you know, it was just a year when I immersed myself in, in the quest to uncover these invisible women. Um, it always worried me that the narrative about slavery was so male orientated. And to some extent, women were kind of um, camp followers or, or invisible in the backdrop of that history. So it was, it was um, an endeavour to really unearth some of those stories and I was always interested in the story of resistance um, because I think resistance has, has, has traditionally been a very male narrative you know when you look at the images of slaves resisting in the you see men setting fire to the cane fields and, and, and you know it's, it's just basically a male narrative so I wanted to know how women had dealt with the experience and the ways they found to not just survive, but to live to tell the tale. And um, I think it's, it's, it's absolutely important that I start by saying that work had already started. You know, in, initially I started looking at the traditional historians and feeling frustrated because it was pretty, particularly white male narrative. But um, I then uncovered um, historians like Lucille Maturin Mayer and Olive Senior and um, Hilary Beckles and Barbara Bush and Richard Sheridan. There's a whole group of historians, Afrocentric historians, I would describe them as, who'd already began to in, engage with the primary sources and start to look beneath that data and those uh, diary entries and other things that you've mentioned to, to tease out what was happening to women in a context where women didn't have, a, have much of a voice. You know, we have very few narratives that, that, that have been handed down to us and Mary Prince is one of them, Mary Seacole is the other, but there's not many women whose voices come out loudly. You know, it's not the same as America where you have the slave narrative. Somebody actually took the trouble to sit down and take those stories down, which provided a rich body of material. But in the West Indian context, that wasn't the case. 
So um, that was the starting point for that. And it rankled me for a while because I felt, A, it was a story that needed to be heard. And B, it was a story that needed to be expanded. So once I reached a point where I was able to do that, my process was really about um, expanding it geographically to look at what was happening elsewhere in, in the West Indies, but also um, tracking back to the starting point in Africa. Because I think quite often we talk about slavery as if it began on the ships, and it didn't. It began in small villages right across the African continent, and um, it began on the Coffle Line and in the Barracoons, and obviously it moved on from that into the Middle Passage and onto the plantations. So I was keen to just try to unearth some of the stories of resistance that existed there. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted to focus on resistance was it really worried me um, when I started writing this book that people would just, just find it too hard to read. It is a hard read. It was very hard to write. And I didn't want people to be depressed by the story. I wanted people to be take, able to take something that was empowering from it. So, um, you know, in beginning to engage with that material, it was very clear that quite often when resistance was referred to, um, there was a tendency to sort of regard people as a genderless mob. And it was really important to try and just identify those few references that existed to women and to build on that and to try to second guess what that might have mean it meant in practice so for example um you know if you look at the maritime the data in the maritime um archives and you look at um the incidents of rebellion on board ship both prior to embarkation during the middle passage and prior to arrival what you see is a very interesting story emerge because although the men tended to be shackled the women were often left to roam free, which gave them um, an ideal privileged position to be able to identify how the watches changed, identify where the weapons were kept. And then you begin to see more references to women who incited the men or who passed weapons over to the men. Now, I think that part of the, the challenge is to engage with this material with a kind of feminist or, or female sensibility and to build on those references to develop an alternative narrative that isn't male dominated, which shows that women had a role to play and which shows that women brought to that struggle um, what they had been, um, what's the word, um, brought up to understand about themselves through their initiation and through their uh, growth and, and, and development on the African continent and of course when you begin to track that story and you look at women like um, Anna Nzinga for example who was a flea in the Portuguese ear for about 30 odd years fighting um, not always actually uh, um, to, to stamp out the slave trade but certainly she was renowned for the fact that she harboured escapees and that she challenged the European encroachment what you begin to see is some very fierce and very feisty women who didn't just stand back and, and accept their, their role as victims in this process. They were actually active agents. And um, you see that agency taken on board the ships and transported naked across the Atlantic Ocean and straight onto the plantations. And that was a starting point for that story. I think um, just to pick up on, on what you said about how so much of the material, it almost seems kind of redundant to say, but so much of the material is, you know, catastrophic. Like it's, it's incredibly hard to read. And what I was kind of thinking when I was reading it is this idea of like, how, how do we engage with um, material that shouldn't exist, right? How do we document and attempt to unearth these histories that of, of you know, destruction, these histories that are so cruel in so many ways? Like, wh what are the methods um, through which we can engage with that? And I think one of them is thinking through resistance, um, uh, uh, absolutely. I wanted to ask, um, kind of linking, you've, you, you went into quite a lot of detail about the specific stories but um one thing one idea that kept kind of reoccurring when you were speaking and when i was reading was this idea of refusal that in every kind of sphere 
um, that women were, were below, uh, that these women were in, whether it be kind of um, through their labor or through reproduction or even through um, like suicide and death and control over life, um, where they were able to kind of, um, in a way, exercise control over um, uh, their circumstances to, to whatever extent they did as a means of resistance. So I wondered if you could just talk a bit about um, the relationship between refusal and rebellion, because I think refusal is a very much a feminist principle, right? That you don't just comply, you don't go along with you know, systems of organization that are like designed to kill you in, in multiple ways. So I guess if you could talk a bit about that, um, maybe in relation specifically to reproduction. Well, well, let me just start by talking about refusal, because I, I see refusal, um, any act of refusal in the context of slavery was an act of rebellion. And in fact, you know, when you look at the punishment records, what you see is they are full of acts of refusal by women. Um, um, even the refusal to contemplate a life lived in chains was the form of refusal. Now, normally you wouldn't look at suicide in that way, but actually there are were, were countless examples of, of, of people who committed mass suicide, not only because they thought they would be reunited with their ancestors, but because they just refused to go along with this, with this um, uh, barbarity. And, um, you know, um, you, you see refusal in the acts of suicide, but you also see it in the small acts that we can detect, um, you know, from women who refuse to follow their mistress's instructions to do the washing properly, um, and women who refuse to contemplate their children being born into enslavement. So they took steps, whatever steps they might be, to ensure that that didn't happen. And of course, running away was another form of refusal. But in terms of the um, uh, issue of reproduction, what became very interesting to me was the data that showed that despite, uh, let, me, let me get this, this, this chronological, um, you know, you have a context where in 1807, the Atlantic slave trade was abolished. And at that point, the whole project of slavery rested on the wombs of black women, because without them reproducing the next generation of enslaved people, there was no, no slavery. So, um, you begin to see discussions in the parliamentary debates and in other contexts, in the, in the diaries and letters, about ameliorating women's conditions, about trying to make it more um, uh, possible for them to give birth and for their children to be brought to term and to actually survive. Despite all those efforts, despite offering women inducements, hogs, cows, money, um, all kinds of enticements, you still see that birth rate plummet. And um, after a while, you begin to see um, agents and overseers and diary entrists scratching their head and say, we don't understand, we've done everything, but still these women are not breeding. And when you look at the data, it's quite evident that something else is going on. And there are actually references to women refusing to breed. Um, um, or references that imply that the women themselves are responsible. Now you then tie that up with references to women using abortants, um, which could only be as a result of those women coming naked across the Atlantic and bring, bringing their knowledge of herbs and plants to the table. Because um, whether the masters thought they controlled every aspect of our lives or not, the reality was that was one area where women still had some agency. And I think the evidence shows that they used that agency because when slavery itself was abolished in 1833, I think that the act was passed, um, what you see is a slow, well, actually a sudden uptake in the birth rate and suddenly the birth rate begins to, to climb. And it's almost as if women gave themselves permission to give birth because they could see their children being born into a possible life that, that involves some degree of freedom. Um, so yes, I think, you know, while it's obvious that not all women took that route, and it may not even be necessarily the case that all women were consciously doing that, there are enough references that show that some women were. And um, I think it's a very interesting narrative, really, when you think about it, that um, 
you know, this was a very gendered barbarity that women were facing, but it was a very gendered response that enabled them to scupper the project. I think, I, I think in a way it's, it, like you say, it's not, it's a, it's a kind of sabotage that maybe isn't apparent um, to everyone, right? And from that, I want to kind of think about like the construction of history. So I, I want to ask you, like in, in your um, researching for this project, um, to, to come back to these ideas of using um, personal accounts. Um, I think you did a really great job of one showing how um, so much of the infrastructure of British political life, i.e. Uh, MPs, um, the Mayor of London, so many people were embroiled attached to the um, slave trade in in monetary form um, and in lots of other ways. I think that that's an important point. But I also think you showed how um, lived experience actually is how we are able to construct this history. And I think there are loads of parts of um, kind of political movements that deride lived experience as somehow not enough um, of a lens to understand the world. But I, I'm interested in, I guess, what your ideas are about how history gets constructed and how um, much like feminists have done before us, we can use lived experience to begin to um, to understand and, and grapple with histories of resistance, I guess, if that makes sense. Okay, well, <clears throat> let's start with Barbara Bush. Um, I can't quote her exactly, but I think she said words to the effect that written, history is written by men for men and thus records largely what men wish, wish to see. And I think that's very much the case particularly in terms of this story. Um, so part of our in, engagement with that history has to be a recognition that um, powerful men have determined what has been passed down to us through time. And it is incumbent on us to challenge those, those versions and to come up with our own um, version of what happened. Um, I personally believe that lived experience is the bedrock of history. It's it, it's what gives us access to the minutiae of people's lives. It's what gives us access to the emotional response that people had to their circumstance. And it turns dry historical data into something tangible and real. And um, those of you who are familiar with um, the heart of the race will know that, you know, that was basically an oral history that allowed women to talk about their impression, to talk about their experience of inequality and injustice um, through the lens of their own lives and their own experiences. Um, so I think, uh, you know, to me, lived experience is, is the starting point. Um, and particularly in a context where so few women had a voice, it's really important to listen to the voices that are out there. Um, certainly in terms of, of the heart of the race and, and the OAD, um, uh, the organisation around OAD, a lot of the politics that emerged, emerged because women were fed up with their lived experience and wanted to do something in their communities to challenge it. So you had um, the SUS campaign that started in someone's front room. You had um, quite a, 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 a vocal black parents campaign, often led or or um, fueled by the energy of women um, that challenge some of the malpractices in, in our schools. And I, I certainly think that, you know, in terms of the black women's movement, such as it was in, in the 70s and 80s, you could say that a lot of our political organisation and campaigns grew out of, you know, one or two women saying, this is happening to me and I want it to stop. You know, and other sisters Grew, um, came around them and nurtured them and, and supported them to ensure that um, those, those malpractices did stop. So, um, yeah, I don't know whether that answers your question, but certainly to me, as I say, lived, lived experience is just like, you start with that. You start with that. I think, I think of it as a um, kind of really rooted in a, in a black feminist tradition and methodology that we know things with our body before we're able to articulate them maybe um and yeah and that's really important um i, I wanted to ask um about the idea of labor in the book you, you talk about how black women's labor reproductive and otherwise um during the backbone of colonial um, economies. And I was wondering, because I know that you come from 
you know, like a Marxist anti-imperialist kind of history in your political consciousness, what you think the echoes are in this present moment in terms of the um, conceptualizations of black women's labor. So thinking about the like black um, woman worker, for example, and thinking about um, the precarity that black women are experiencing because of COVID, because of what's happening, um, because of yeah, how they're positioned in the workforce. I guess if, if you could speak to that a little bit, that would be really um, Yeah, I was thinking about that question, Lola, and I, I, it, I was reminded of something we said in the heart of the race, um, where I think the quote was, black women's experience of work in Britain mirrors our experience of work over the last five centuries. And it's been one long tradition of back-breaking labor in the service of European capitalism. And I think that statement stands now and is as true now as it ever was. Now, you know, under enslavement, what was absolutely clear was that for the first um, few centuries, black women's labor was far more important than their breeding potential. You know, that was the only thing that was important. And actually the, 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 the mantra was that it was better to buy than to breed. Um, and, what what struck me when I was writing about the way black women's labor was exploited and used under enslavement was that so many of those experiences resonate with black women's experience of labor today. Um, you've only got to look at the experience of, of migrant workers in Spain, you know, and the conditions under which they produce the fruit and vegetables that appear on our supermarket shelves to know that you know, the conditions they work in aren't that dissimilar to the conditions that um, people experienced on the plantation, if you take away the whip, you know. Um, now, I think this, this pandemic has really shone a light on the extent to which this society is still dependent on the labour of black, black women, you know, whether you're talking about the NHS or whether you're talking about people who clean our, 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 our uh, streets or who service in our shops or do any of those jobs um, you know with very few exceptions the vast majority of black women remain exploited low-paid workers um, and that's the situation both in Britain and, and globally and um, I would possibly argue that their lives and their aspirations are as disposable now as they ever were um, now, I, I guess some people would say, well, look at Michelle, look at Oprah, look at Beyonce, look at all those women who's kind of broken through that barrier. Um, surely you can't say that that's the same. But as you say, you know, I've always had a, a, um, a politics that is anti-imperialist. So I cannot just take um, those examples and uh, assume that that means everybody can break through the barrier. I think for the vast majority of women, particularly in our countries of origin, the reality is that they're still low paid, exploited and disposable. Um, now, I think with the access to the internet that we now have, there are huge possibilities for women to challenge those traditional stereotypical roles and, you know, even even young women like yourself going to Cambridge, going to Oxford, you know, those are stories that give us hope and, and, and fill our hearts with, with joy. But I don't think we need to be fooled into thinking that that's necessarily um, meant that all women have access to the same opportunities, or indeed that a lot of the issues that we have fought against over, over the decades are necessarily resolved. And I think there's, there's countless examples of, of, of of women who are, are exploited and whose, whose labour is abused to this day. Um, and what worries me, I think, is with the new technology, although it presents lots of opportunities for us to communicate across national boundaries and to, to make common cause around any issue we choose, there's also the reality that with the new technologies and with artificial in, uh, intelligence and all the other things that are coming, coming into, into the frame, that workers of all colours are increasingly, um, you know, disposable and dispensable. They're not needed so much. So we're going to have to reimagine how we how we can aspire to new things, really. And I know I was talking to um, a, a young woman 
just the other day and she was talking about how you know her 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 daughter um i don't know how old the daughter was but certainly under 10 is busy writing her first novel and she was reminded it was candice braithwaite williams that's who i was talking to and she was saying that her father had wanted to be a writer but just dismissed the idea because he thought it was never possible so you know those kinds of stories are um encouraging because they do show that we've got daughters and granddaughters who will aspire to things that our mothers and grandmothers never could but i don't think there's any room for complacency and i think we still have to continue to struggle to bring other sisters along with us to ensure that simply because a few of us manage to break through those barriers that we don't just forget who we are and forget the context that is the reality for most women around the globe and also i think there's a there's a part of it that's um about like not allowing those institutions to use you as evidence of anything right because we know like places like oxford came like o oxford cambridge have their own complicities in these kinds of histories and so even if we make we make it there in in some sense i guess the, the challenge is to do away with this idea that representation is enough like um it's to kind of like it, in a kind of continuation to sabotage the project, I guess. Um, I kept some, something that um, kept kind of reoccurring when I was um, reading the book was this idea um, that when you're when you're capable of being like bought and sold like cattle or akin to cattle, so much about that kind of destroys categories that we use to understand social life so ideas of like woman and human and and i think you you talk really well about how um white women uh, for example at, at a time when pregnant um enslaved black women um you know were the recipients of the a whip were made to do kind of the back-breaking labor that you that you speak about white women um in the same circumstances were seen as kind of fragile and light and you know um not or capable to do work right and so it, it got me thinking about this idea of womanhood as like a, this unitary category that somehow we all exist under and I was wondering yeah what your thinking was around um, that categorization this idea that um, women's experiences are all the same or that the idea of womanhood is enough to bring us together and, and does a, an approach that does away with that categorization or at least attempts to question or critique it is that a way to open up and understand like black life um in the uk in the past and and like in the present clearly not all women are the same and um i know anybody who's who's familiar with um, the heart of the race will know that a lot of the way black women organized um, started from a position that we couldn't just organize around issues of gender, that class and race were absolutely central to our experience. And that's what made our struggle different. And a lot of our differences with the white women's movement in the, in the 70s and 80s was about the failure of that movement or the failure of those women to understand that. So um, clearly we have to understand those nuances and those differences if we are to develop any kind of sisterhood and that often means that we have to stand back from our relatively privileged position in the west and recognize that for some women you know the struggle is simply for food shelter and clothing you know it's not you know we, we can't even begin to look at some of the more um uh, the other details that women would want to address because you know those those basic rights to survival have not yet been won by some women um so i think it's really important that if if we think about how we engage together as women that we are sensitive to those differences on the other hand um i've always believed that we need to focus on our commonalities rather than our differences if we're to make common cause and we know better than anyone how divide and rule has been used over the centuries to dissipate our struggles and to leave us fighting each other rather than focusing our energy, energies on the real, real issues that we should be addressing. So um, there's a tension there, isn't there, between recognizing our difference, but also trying to accept that despite those differences there should be ways that we make common cause 
I'm reminded when you're talking, Lola, when you were talking, Lola, of my frustrations around the Black Lives Matter movement, because um, um, one of the things that, that, that bothered me was that so much of the focus was on Black Lives in the West. You know, um, we, we can go out and demonstrate because a black man is killed in America, but we don't go out and demonstrate when we hear of black children dying of preventable diseases. Those black lives matter too. And I think that analogy works as much in terms of anti-racist struggles as it does in terms of feminist struggles. Um, you know, the Me Too movement, Yes, of course we want to challenge um, sexual abuse and sexual harassment, but we also have to recognize in some societies, um, before they can even get to that point, there are struggles to be won around the right for your, of your child to just survive beyond the first six weeks. So we need to keep it real and not just stay focused so much on our own neighbors that we forget the real world out there. I guess um, what, what you're saying is making me think um, about how the concept of, of global sisterhood is, is maybe enacted as a means of solidarity, right? As a means of recognizing our own in and, and um, attempting to make visible the chains of exploitation that connect us with the aim of, you know, ending it. Um, yeah, I guess ending that exploitation. I wanted to ask um, about uh, I think this book is, is incredibly timely, especially because we've seen, you know, in this year, challenges to statues and monuments um, to, you know, slave owners across the UK. And we've seen um, the symbolic challenge, I guess, um, to, to uh, or, or we've been able to witness the demand for, um, to, uh, for a critical account of imperial history, I guess through the, the challenge to the symbolic idea of the, the monument to the slave trader, et cetera. And, and we did, um, we saw that as well with Roads Must Fall. But I'm interested in, I guess, um, what, how you think we move um, beyond the realm of the symbolic to a more kind of material redistrib redistribution of power and resource. Because as you, as you probably know, like it's all well and good, like um, tearing down st statues, but it's actually really important to transform material conditions. And by that, I mean, transform the, the ways that we live. And I think what, you're, what you've done in the book by showing how economically entangled so much of the the British political class was and is with slavery um, is is yeah I guess shown how there's so much to to be undone there's so much to to destroy before we can make a claim to any of the resources in this country so I guess yeah if you could if you could speak to moving beyond symbolism and and monuments well I think statues and monuments have always been used to reinforce the mainstream narrative haven't they 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 uh, you know um, they project this this image of glorious white conquest and and benign civilizing missions and all these fallacies that we're taught in in schools and um you know the same can be said of our national you know our stately homes and other things where they only tell a snippet of the history or they airbrush us out. So um, I think it is important for us to challenge those and to, um, if not tear them down, at least allow for us a, a different, more honest narrative to appear. And I've heard some really subversive ways that this could happen, um, including, you know, like tripping your mobile phone to tell you what this guy was really doing rather than what it just says on the statue, which I really like the idea of. But um, what those monuments and statues do in effect, is sort of bolster this narrative that, that somehow black people have no entitlement to share in the wealth and resources that this country has. And certainly it's only in recent years that you've begun to hear um, um, people pointing out that there is no great in Great Britain without the story of enslavement and colonialism. There just isn't. And this great story of empire and um, the British rise to power is very much um, um, obligated to the blood, sweat and tears of, of black people. So um, 
yes, we have to move beyond tearing down statues and we have to be careful not to get too embroiled in gesture politics. You know, um, tearing down the statues is one. The other big debate recently was about, um, what was it, a land of hope and glory. You know, I, I couldn't give two hoots about whether they, they sing Britain never shall be slaves. That doesn't matter. To me, what matters is that Britain no longer enslaves other people and that continues unabated. So we have to find ways of moving beyond those symbolic gestures to really challenging where the wealth and power of this country came from and how it could be more equally distributed. Um, personally, I think that part of the problem is that we still subscribe to this notion of black history as if it's something separate from the mainstream history that we're taught. And I think that allows people to think of both black people and their contribution as something separate to the body politic. So I, I, I think, you know, um, what we need to be calling for in the first instance is a more honest account of the history. And through that more honest account of the history, you'll begin to challenge those voices that say, what are they doing here? They don't have the right to be here. You only have to look at the Windrush scandal to see how that narrative played out. This notion that people who have for centuries slaved and toiled to produce the wealth that this country now enjoys are treated like disposable objects that can just be thrown away once they're no longer needed. Um, that kind of narrative can only be challenged if we really begin to retell the history in a way that's honest and which includes, you know, the less palatable aspects of that history. Yeah, and I think it also calls us to have a kind of critical relationship to, to the nation and to ideas of citizenship, right? Like, Absolutely. Yeah, it complicates our understanding of these ideas of like belonging and identity, which are so often thrust upon mm. uh, like black people in the UK or black British people living in, in the UK. Um, I wanted to ask a bit of a broader question. I think a, a lot of your work in general springs from a place of political education, and, and you and you say and you say in that, that this book assuaged the nine-year-old in you who was hungry for history that you've just been talking about. Um, and I guess part of the, part of the impetus of this book was an attempt to address a gap. Um, and I wondered. I wondered what your two questions. I wondered what your idea, what your ideas around this idea of rediscovering history. I think something that is constantly brought up is this idea that like black history doesn't really exist in the UK, isn't taught, we don't know it. And so we're constantly trying to excavate. We're con constantly trying to, to make visible his history. But I think of you as a kind of living history. And we know that the history is there and the history has always existed. It's, it's maybe about the roots through which we're able to find and engage with it. So I wondered what your, your thoughts were on that idea. But then I also wanted to ask you what the place of political education has been in your life and what it has enabled for you um, as someone who was the recipient of it, but also as someone who has, has given it to other people. Well, let me start with the second question first, because I can only cope with one question at a time. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I've always been in education, Lola, you know, and um, even when I started out as a rookie teacher teaching German back in the early 70s, I was the first black teacher in that school. Um, it bothered me um, that, you know, the subject was being taught in a kind of vacuum. So instead of teaching about Herr and Frau Schmidt with their Volkswagen and their 2.4 children in, in, you know, Hamburg, I put my German family in the middle of Namibia. <laughs> and that enabled me to engage with the young people that I was teaching um, with a discussion about how language is a function of colonialism. Um, it enabled me to talk to them about why German was spoken in other parts of the world and how Germans got to be there and all those other issues that enable you not just to understand the language, but understand the way the language is used. Um, so I think from, from the, the, the very get-go as a teacher, I always had that sense that um, there was scope for political education, whatever you're teaching. Um, I did spend some time in the early 80s teaching black studies, although we called it history and popular culture because um, even then we had to hide behind that kind of uh, shield but um 
what I saw, we were teaching unemployed women in Tottenham and we made that curriculum central to a course was essentially about enabling them to go out and find jobs. And what I saw was a transformation in some of those women. You know, they'd come to us saying, I want to learn to type. And they'd come out at the end of that course saying, I want to be a brain surgeon or I want to be a rocket scientist or whatever. And I'm going to leave my husband and do it my way. And it was transformative. And why was it transformative? It was empowering for them to learn a history that didn't project them as victims, that actually gave them some agency and which allowed them to place their own experience of life in a wider political, social, political context. They, they began to see that it wasn't just them. It was actually about the system and that empowered them to begin to look at how the system might change. Now, um, I don't know whether um, that's answered your question. Just remind me what this, the first part of the question was again. It was something to do with um, recovery and rediscovery of history. Yeah. Frame that black people in the UK are always um, kind of, we have this relationship, or, or what is forced onto us is a relationship with history that's constantly about excavation or rediscovery, as if the, the history itself didn't, it isn't already present. Um, and I think about that in terms of like the black mm -hmm. feminist movement, for example, we're always constantly um, thinking about groups like OAD, for example, um, alongside the mainstream right and so there, there is this narrative that's um created that 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 kind of history or, or that kind of black feminist formation exists on the periphery and so i'm just wondering you know about your thoughts about that kind of framing well um yeah it's it's pretty evident that that's what they do and i think um i don't see it as onerous personally you know um for me i think there's always been hidden histories and you can take any, any marginalized group and see that process of airbrushing out of history going on. So I don't even see it necessarily as um, a task that is simply for black people to engage with. You know, women have to engage with it. Uh, queer people have to engage with it. There's a whole range of people who could say, we've been airbrushed out of history and now's our chance to actually tell the story from our perspective. So I don't see it as onerous. I actually see that as exciting and engaging. And I've always encouraged my students to do that, not because um, they feel omitted, but because the act of learning about themselves is empowering, as I've said before. Um, you know, our national institutions, of course, they're going to benefit from our erasure but I don't think it's incumbent on just us to do it. I think, um, you know, I, part of your question was something to do with black scholars and thinkers and whether there's some kind of pressure on them to do that. And of course it's good if they can, because we can tell it from our own perspective and with our own sensibilities. But I also know that, you know, my study of history has been greatly informed by the work of people who don't look like me. You know, so I think I see it as a collective project. I see it as something that we should all be engaging with. And I think there's a lot of history that yet has yet to be unearthed simply because history is a long time in the making and it can never be fully told. You know, we will always be unearthing stories. So um, I don't know. I think, um, yeah, it, it's, a, it, it's an exciting thing to do and we shouldn't see it as onerous. We should see it as as challenging and something that we can do now that we have access to all that material. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to, uh, I'm going to ask one last question and then we're going to open it up um, for Q&A questions. So please do write your questions in the Q&A box and then we can ask Stella. I guess my last question um, to, to, to round up is I, my research is kind of about the imagination and the uses of the imagination in um, political or organizing in kind of cultural production and so I again two two parts of this question I wondered um, 
what keeps you engaged in political struggle? I think that's a question that constantly kind of comes up, but I'm really interested because everybody gives such different answers. Um, and what do you think the role of the imagination or visioning or Im being able to imagine otherwise or being able to imagine beyond what you've been, um, been given? What do you think the role of that is in political struggle, in political resistance? And I guess, how is it, um, has it been meaningful for you? How, how have you engaged with it? What keeps me engaged in political struggle is the knowledge that, you know, we've won a lot of battles, but we have yet to win the war. Um, and I know now that I'm pushing 70, that my ability to engage in struggles in the way that I used to has been severely curtailed by this damn p pandemic. You know, I, I was frustrated that I couldn't go on the demonstrations, the Black Lives Matter demonstrations. I'm frustrated that I can't go out and engage with the world in the same way as um, I've always been uh, been used to. But I do know that as long as I live and breathe, while there is injustice and inequality in this world, then there's a struggle to be waged. So that's what keeps me engaged. In terms of the role of the imagination, um, I was reading some of your book, Feminism Interrupted. And I really liked what you said about imagination because I agree with you that, you know, we have to be able to imagine a different world. We have to be able to think outside the box and to come up with alternative ways of being if we're to create a world that is more equal and more, more, more equitable and more just. So um, whether that imagination is fed through the books that we read or the plays that we see or the art that we engage with there's all kinds of ways the music that we hear um you know there are countless ways in which imagination can give us a glimpse of how it could be and um i think you know that has to fuel our struggles it has to because um you know anything else is is tired and old and doesn't really cut the mustard for me. You know, we, um, even when you look at things like the abolitionist movement, you know, I had quite a lot of difficulty getting my head around that initially. You know, I remember going to um, a conference, I think you may have even been there, where we were talking about abolitionism and, and, and the prison movement. And I was thinking, yeah, but you know, what do you do with the Rosemary Wests? And, you know, I really had a hard time getting my head around it. But then when I started thinking it through and engaging with it and really grappling with what it meant to actually have a society that didn't rely on the incarceration of tens of thousands of people and that actually began to look at the root causes that lead some people from the classroom to the, to the, to the cell, then I began to see that, yes, actually it is important for us to imagine a world where we can, we can open up those prisons and do it differently. Now... As I've said before, I think history is a long time in the making and, and, you know, it's often small steps that will take us towards those visions. But we have to still believe that it's possible, don't we? Otherwise, how else are we to survive in, in what is a very, very difficult world, a very difficult time, a time when all of us are having to rethink how we're to live our lives and engage with the societies in which we're, we're, we're incarcerated at the moment whether it's in our homes or our kitchens or wherever we're, we're basically stuck at home aren't we yeah and i think it, it makes me think about the importance of a kind of radical flexibility in your thinking right to always know that there is, is something to to learn or, or a way that you might be able to change your mind i think that that's so crucial in you know like growing in your politics and i think of feminism as as a methodology that is never done like as a framework that is all like ever expansive, always generative, always, you know, presenting um, a new way of, of thinking and looking at, at, at like specific issues. Mm. Um, so much, um, Stella, this has been such a wonderful conversation. And, and now I'm going to ask some questions um, from the audience. We only have one so far. So if you have a question, um, so we have a question from Gail and Gail said, Stella, can you say a bit more about the need for working autonomously and yet making coalitions between women in the current phase of the feminist movement? I'm not sure I said working autonomously. I think what I was saying is that we need to recognise that there are significant differences. 
and I know from all I can do is speak from my own experience I have to preface anything by saying I don't have any of the answers here I'm like everybody else I'm grappling with these issues I'm open to ideas I'm listening to other people's suggestions but I certainly don't think any of us have come up with uh, definitive answers but I do know that we have to be sensitive to our differences we have to um, allow people to engage with the struggles that are meaningful to them and to join it up in a way that makes sense to others. Um, um, I'm, I'm mindful of um, OAD again. I was talking earlier about OAD and for those of you who don't know, it was an umbrella organization that tried to um, bring together all those local women's groups and um, organizations that were community-based in a way that allowed women to have, or black women to have a voice. And that wasn't necessarily about speaking with one voice. You know, OAD was um, unique because it tried to organize around the principle of African and Asian unity. And we all know from our own lived experience that there are very significant differences between women of African descent and women of Asian descent. But nevertheless, there's enough commonalities for us to recognize that we can make common cause. And I think those commonalities give us strength. Unity is strength. That doesn't mean to say that we ignore the fact that people come from different contexts or may have different priorities, but it allows people to have the, the flexibility and the sensitivity to say, okay, that's your experience, this is mine. Where can we come together on, on this to make common cause? And quite often what you find is although people's experiences of racism and sexism and class oppression and all those other oppressions um, may be different, actually the cause is the same. The enemy is the same. And I think if we keep that in mind, it helps us sometimes to overcome some of those, those differences that actually can be used to divide us and to separate us and to make us less powerful. Um, there's another question here from Abira who wants to know if you could talk specifically about um, the political campaigns that OAD um, ran and kind of um, about strategy, how you organised together, what kind of mechanisms you used, um, yeah, and, and how what the experience of organising in that way was like. Well, okay, OAD was unique in a number of ways. I think because a lot of the women who came into the organization came from experiences of working in organizations that were either male dominated or um, which didn't focus on issues that affected women. There was a lot of frustration about some of the traditional ways that those organizations had been, had been run. So although it wasn't always necessarily a conscious decision, what evolved as we became together and started working together was an attempt to be non-hierarchical, an attempt to be fluid enough to allow women to come in and out. So for example, when we met, um, A, we would meet in different people's houses or in different spaces, but we also recognized that the same woman couldn't always represent that organization because she might have childcare or she might have other demands on her life that made that difficult. So there was a fluidity in allowing different voices to emerge. In terms of the organization, uh, the campaigns that OAD focused on, um, that was very much the campaigns that were brought to the table by women in different communities who were struggling against different injustices. So, um, for example, as I said, there was a lot of focus on education because that was a key issue, but there were also for, um, issues around women's bodies. Um, for example, the Depo Provera campaign, where we recognised that this injectable contraceptive was being trialled not just on black women, and I'm not talking about not just talking about black women here, but black women in Zimbabwe, which was in the middle of a genocidal war, but also working class women in, in Glasgow. And, and, you know, the evidence was showing that Depo Vivera was causing some quite serious side effects. So there was scope there for us not just to focus on how it was affecting black women in a context where, don't forget, black women had faced attempts at genocide for decades, for centuries. So it wasn't just about um, 
you know, seizing this contraceptive. It was about placing it in a context where actually some women may want to change their mind and have children. Um, but it also meant that we could make common cause with working class white women who were also facing those kinds of tactics. Um, and I think it's, it's worth mentioning here that there was that kind of, oh, what's the word, disjuncture with, with um, the campaign around a woman's right to choose, where of course a woman's right to choose not to have children had to be weighed against a woman's right to choose to have children. You know, there was always that kind of added dimension that we brought to it because we had that anti-imperialist focus, we were grounded in our communities and we saw how racism worked and how class oppression worked. Um, what else can I say about OAD? You know, I wouldn't want to present a picture to the, that suggests it was all rosy. You know, there were some, some disagreements, there were women grappling with identity issues and with all kinds of other issues that had to be addressed as well. And, you know, if you look at OAD, it was relatively short-lived, you know, it was what, five years in, in total. But what I realize now, and I, I was having this conversation with my co-authors at the Heart of the Race when we were um, doing the afterword for the republished uh, book, um, what we realized was that although the organization didn't survive beyond those five years, the ideas, the dreams, the beliefs, the imaginations that were formulated during those years lived on. And they lived on through our careers, through our relationships, and through the way we nurtured and brought up our children. So you can still see the resonances of those, those struggles in, in our lives today. And I think um, that's possibly true of all organisations. Somebody asked me the other day whether Black Lives Matter was a movement or a moment. And my answer was, well, it was both. You know, and in the same way, our Black women's movement was a moment in history, but it was also a movement that has survived and grown and developed and will continue to survive and grow and develop as long as there are Black women taking up that banner and moving it forward. Um, we have lots of questions now. Oh, um, <laughs> um, so... How do we um, ensure that things learn? Oh, actually, we've got a question from Ruth who asks, thinking about how feminism has been co-opted in many ways by neoliberalism, do you think we'll see the same thing happen with the Black Lives Matter movement and the awakening to racism in the UK and US and, and elsewhere? I.e., will ideas from the anti-racist movements of the past be co-opted and di diluted? What do you think? Um, I think inevitably that's likely to happen because, um, you know, history tells us that, that that's, that's the process. But I also know that um, the core demands will live on as long as there's a need to make those demands. And it is for us to be vigilant to make sure that those demands stay on the table. Um, you know, a few more black faces visible in the media or a few more programs that focus on the history of Africa or the history of enslavement are not going to change the material conditions of the vast majority of people who are still struggling to survive and feed their kids. Um, they're not necessarily going to change the brutalities that we've seen played out on our screens in terms of the way the police behave in our communities. So um, yes, it's likely that we will be appeased by some of those neoliberal responses but I suspect that most of us are savvy enough to know that that actually isn't going to resolve the core issues and just as with you know the anti-racist struggles you know those issues just keep coming back at us don't they it's not like they're going away now you know I'm old enough to remember civil rights and I know that the civil rights movement both in America and in this country led to some meaningful changes, but it didn't actually address all the issues that still remain you know, um, prevalent in our lives. So the struggle continues. And I suspect that's going to be true of um, feminist struggles too. You know, it has to be, doesn't it? We, haven't, we don't really need to think that simply because a few women get on the boardroom of some you know, organizations or are more visible 
on our TV screens that somehow the struggle has been won. If we think that, then we are fooling ourselves. And I think, yeah, and there's, yeah, there's so much we give up on when we, we think that that's, I guess, the end of the line or the end of, you know, the struggle. Um, somebody said, how can we ensure the things learnt slash created from OAD and similar organisations aren't lost with that generation? And what work can be done to make sure connections across generations are maintained both in terms of archiving and forging cross-generational communities? Well, um, you know, I come from a culture where cross-generational dialogue was always present. You know, I think of sitting on the stoop in my auntie's house in Accra, with my uncles and my aunties and people of all ages running around and engaging in discussions. So I think, you know, as, as a black woman, I would say that's, that's part of what we do. We have that conversation. If I put my teacher's hat on, I'd say it starts in the classroom. You know, um, if we want our children to grow up with a different narrative, we have to teach them a different narrative. And if it isn't being uh, taught in schools, then we have to make sure it's taught in the home. And, you know, kids are, a lot more savvy these days they're not so dependent on their elders telling them what's going on they google it they find out for themselves and they're far more um, equipped to do that than, than some of the older generation are so i think that to some extent we've created a generation who will continue to find out and to learn and who will be suspicious of narratives that suggest that the struggles have been won um, I've kind of forgotten the, the rest of the question because it was multi, multi-focused. It was, um, the, the rest of the question was just basically about archiving and, and forging That's um, right. educational communities. Yeah. But I guess I also speak to that because I think that um, a lot of my work is kind of focused on that. But I also think that conversations like these are a means of doing just that, of opening up a space for reflection, of opening mm -hmm. up a space mm -hmm. where a, different generations talk about what feminism is and what it can offer. I also think um, archiving as a practice has so much to do with that and I think it also comes from um, rethinking what we think belongs in the archive if that makes sense like yeah. every interested in you know old pamphlets and materials and posters all of those things for me are imbued with a kind of mm -hmm. national revolutionary potential they tell their own stories and so I think we maybe we think of the archive as like this very official kind of linear um, means of documenting history but I, I'm, I'm really interested in fragmentary appro approaches where we put like old notes and diaries and and all of these um, things that then become ways that we unearth history and we and I think that's what your book does so excellently show us how actually personal accounts, diary entries, um, uh, just written accounts of the things that people have seen in the world become a means of constructing history, right? Um, we have yeah, let me just say something about that, Lola, before you move on to the next question, because I, I, I missed that, and I think it's a really important question. Um, I absolutely agree with you, and I'm always telling people, you know, you don't have to um, see it as something out there it starts with getting out your phone and recording your grandma's story it starts with going through your attic and just retrieving some of that stuff that you thought wasn't of value and you know the number of people I've spoken to said that's that's not worth keeping and it's like yes it is part of the reason why I've got an archive at the Black Cultural Archive is because I'm a a hoarder I couldn't throw anything away I knew that at some point that stuff was going to be important to someone I'm so glad I didn't chuck it in a skip because now there's a constant stream of people or at least there was until COVID going into the BCA and sifting material and making sense of it and seeing its value and its importance um, and not just sort of political posters and, and, and pamphlets but also as you say personal stories and, and personal personal um, artifacts. Um, I'm frustrated by the fact that we've only got an archive with limited space because for me material objects um, are part of that archive. You know, I, I think of the badges that I've accumulated over the years, you know, which tell their own story. Um, the t-shirts that I've got that loudly proclaim, you know, that feminism is a verb, not just a, uh, you know, a noun. And those kinds of things that, that just say it as it is and which inform future generations and allow them to build on. Um, 
what was done before. So I think archives are absolutely vital and central. And if we struggle for nothing else, we should struggle for space to not just um, donate our documents, but also create museums which allow us to touch and feel and engage with material objects that shape people's lives. I wanted to say something about some work I did years ago um, in Cardiff, where um, I was actually doing some research into the support um, that was available for black elders at the time. And I started engaging with a group that was involved in reminiscence work. And they literally were going around the old public houses. This was in Cardiff, which was about to be, you know, raised to the ground. So people were really keen to ensure that even though the community was being scattered, that the stories were somehow preserved. And people, young people were going into the pubs and speaking to the old men, getting them to find their old love letters and their old passports and their old seamen's papers and literally sit down with the youth and talk to them about what those pieces of paper meant. And it was hugely educational. It was hugely educational. I think that that's something that we can all do in our own homes. You know, as you say, it doesn't have to be in an institution. We all have the, the, the capacity now, particularly with the technologies that we have access to, to begin that work. And it really excites me to see young people engaged in it. I think it, it's, it's fantastic. Okay, I, I completely agree. Um, so maybe we'll just have two more questions. So here's one that says, in regard to black women's movements and the necessity to decenter the West and engage with women across the world, how can we ensure that we are not doing this in a tokenistic way and in a meaningful way that enacts change? Whew. Well, I suppose the starting point is to listen. You know, not to assume that you have all the answers. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, what's, what I was thinking about as you were talking, Leila, was um, an experience I had recently in Ghana, where, as you may know, there's a huge, you know, effort to encourage the diaspora to come home. And I know from talking to members of my own family that there's a tension there when people from the West, you know, of whatever hue, return to their countries of origin and, and act like they've got all the answers. Um, so we need to bring humility to that project. We need to be to open up our ears and to listen. And we need to allow people to come up with the answers themselves. Um, and not be arrogant, because otherwise we're just reproducing the same power structures that have already existed. And I don't think it's, it's enough to think that just because we are black like them, that, ne that necessarily we won't engage in those same kind of colonial or arrogant practices. We've only got to look at, um, what is it I was reading today, Red Nose Day and that whole, you know, um, what do they call it, comic relief and the sort of white saviour mentality that they brought to that project to see how, how very easy it is to slip into that, into those shoes. Um, we're far more aware of the dangers of that now and I think um, you know as I say if we listen to people and allow them to use their own voices to make their own demands rather than assume to speak for them then um, you know we can avoid those kinds of practices in the future. I think then just to close off the um, uh, very last question is do you consider your writing and your work to be a kind of creative practice? Um, do you think there is this division between kind of politics and art or like what do you see, um, I guess, as your role um, uh, as an educator? Do you think of education as, as creative? Most definitely, yeah, of course it is. It's, um, you know, anybody who's had to sit down and prepare a lesson and think, how am I going to explain to these kids X or Y or Z? You know, you have to bring creativity to that, especially if you're teaching a group that is, um, you know, a mixed group, mixed ability and with mixed learning styles. So, yes, definitely writing is a creative process. I've actually been engaged for longer than I care to admit in an attempt to write a novel. 
and I'm very mindful that there's creativity and there's creativity. You know, when I look at um, the work of Maya Angelou or, um, you know, um, Nawal El Sadawi or um, Zora Neale Hurston, you know, all the women who've shaped my, um, my reading, um, I'm absolutely humbled because I know that there are some people who are like, you know, up there on a pedestal and all I can do is aspire. So I'd like to claim that uh, my writing is creative, but I know that, um, you know, uh, some people might possibly challenge that. But I think, um, yes, writing is a creative process and um, uh, I hope that people will see in, in all the stuff that I've written um, that, you know, that, that's been the case. Um, and certainly we can look at the creative women around us or women who've gone before us and see them as a standard of excellence to which we can aspire. And I certainly continue to do that. I'm humbled sometimes. And in fact, I have to fight against it because, you know, I pick up a novel and I read something. I've just finished reading um, Essie Ed Edugian's book, Washington Black. And I'm so humbled by this sister because I think, wow, how did she do that, you know? Um, and I have to fight against um, the disempowerment sometimes that I feel when I see such fantastic creativity because I think, oh, I could never do that. It doesn't matter how hard I try. I just don't have the brain to do that. But um, that's just my internal process. Yeah, writing is a creative process, whatever you're writing, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. I really look forward to, to reading that novel. Oh, one day. God, don't wait too long. <laughs> thank you so much, Stella. This has been such a wonderful end to the day for me. Um, and I thank you for, um, who's come and who's listened, and thank you for asking questions. On behalf of the Feminist Library, please do check us out. Um, but yeah, do you want to say anything to round off, Stella? No, just um, obviously, I don't know how many people are listening in, and I can't see your faces or or expressions, which is one of the frustrations of all this Zooming, but I do hope that people have found it useful and instructive and, and uh, inspiring and uh, go forth and do battle because as I say, we won a few battles, but there's still a big war to be won. Thank you so much, Stella. Thank you. I think, I think the meeting will end just automatically. But... Okay. Bye Lola, nice talking to you. As always.